In 1988, Sony, a newcomer to the video game space, attempted to tie up with Nintendo to release a CD-ROM accessory for Nintendo's under-development SNES console. The accessory was to have been called the PlayStation, leveraging Sony's expertise in compact discs to solve one of the SNES's greatest shortcomings, the tiny amount of storage space on the cartridges. Nintendo, the established market leader, flirted with the idea for some time, before unceremoniously dropping it when it announced a partnership with Philips for the CD-ROM accessory at CES 1991. After this letdown, Ken Kutaragi and the folks at Sony made the momentous decision to press on and design their own console, built around the CD, a new high-capacity storage medium. The resulting PSX was a remarkable success, and outsold both its 5th gen competitors, the N64 and the Sega Saturn. PlayStation became a household name, and now after 25 years, the pendulum swung so far in the other direction that the largest share of Sony's revenue comes from PlayStation and related products. Not bad for something that started off as an unofficial solo project by Kutaragi. Of the PlayStation consoles, however, the PS2 was by far the most successful, the longest lived, and, well, subjectively, the most fondly remembered. 158 million PS2 units have been sold since the console's launch. That's enough for 2.5% of the entire world's population to own one. The PS2's success, though, is attributed not just to a stellar line of exclusives, but also to the way it's offered up advanced hardware at a more compelling price than its competition. Compared to the GameCube and the Xbox, the PS2 was known for being difficult to program. However, the craft of first-party studios most familiar with the hardware shines through in titles like Shadow of the Colossus. Here we're going to take a deep dive into the PS2's hardware architecture and find out what made this remarkable machine tick. The PS2's infamous Emotion Engine and Graphics Synthesizer are responsible for rendering and displaying visuals. However, the PS2 has a couple more components under the hood to take care of various other functions. The I.O. Processor the I.O. processor takes care of all input and output functions, including connections to the controller and the USB ports. The I.O. processor picks up controller input and sends it to the Emotion Engine, where the game world state can then be updated to match your input. Additionally, the I.O. processor actually incorporates an entire PS1 CPU core. This is paired with 2MB of EDO DRAM, the same as is found in the PS1. This enables the backwards compatibility with the PS1 titles. The Sound Processor The PS2 sound card has dedicated hardware to enable up to 5.1 DTS surround sound, with a sampling frequency of up to 48 kHz. We'll speak about the flexibility of the Emotion Engine's coprocessors further on in the video. While ordinarily used for physics and AI calculations and geometry rendering, the Vector coprocessors can also be utilized for generating DTS sound effects, something EA leveraged in EA Sports titles like SSX Tricky. A 10-channel DMA controller ties together all the disparate pieces of hardware, allowing for up to 10 simultaneous transfers across the bus. The DMA directs the traffic, freeing the other components from having to manage transfers themselves. And lastly, there's 32 megabytes of RD RAM with 3.2 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. The Emotion Engine, Graphic Synthesizer, and IPU. The Emotion Engine is the very heart of the PS2. It was designed with multiple functions in mind. These include geometry calculations, world simulation, and a variety of miscellaneous functions. The PS2's ability to render models with very high poly counts was heavily promoted by Sony in early years. This is down to the Emotion Engine's exceptional DSP, or Display Signal Processing capabilities, with 10 floating-point multiply accumulators handling vector calculations. This is augmented by the Scratchpad RAM, or SP RAM, a 16KB buffer of very fast memory that's directly integrated into the Emotion Engine. The Emotion Engine is then connected to the Graphics Synthesizer via the Graphics Interface, or GIF. The Emotion Engine sends display lists, which are sets of rendering instructions to the Graphics Synthesizer, which then actually does the graphics rendering. 
The EE is a multi-purpose component, as we'd mentioned earlier. This is possible because its subcomponents and combinations thereof are designed for specialized tasks. The EE comprises of a MIPS 3 based CPU, two vector coprocessors and an image processing unit. The CPU itself is based on the MIPS 3 instruction set and is clocked at 299 MHz. The CPU works in tandem with one of these, the VU0. Together with the VU0, the CPU handles physics calculations, behaviors, AI, and other non-visual calculations. VU0 is connected to the CPU via a high-speed 128-bit bus. Meanwhile, the VU1 and the graphics synthesizer handle visual rendering. The VU1 does calculations that are turned into display lists. The VU1 has a 128-bit bus connection to the GIF, its interface with the graphics synthesizer, across which it feeds display lists to the graphics synthesizer. While the VU1 and VU0 have specialized functions, they are at a part level functionally identical. As such, there's a degree of flexibility in the way that they can be utilized. For instance, the VU0 and the CPU can also be used to take care of vector calculations. The graphics synthesizer and the sound processor have video and audio outs respectively. The PS2 supports a maximum 1080i resolution over the composite cable. A handful of games, such as Gran Turismo 4, actually run at this resolution, though upscaled. Lastly, the IPU is an additional subcomponent of the EE, which is responsible for MPEG-2 decoding. This is what allows the PS2 to play back DVDs and also to handle in-game FMV sequences. The PS2 at the time of launch was considered difficult to work with. Regardless, massive sales and a wide net of first- and second-party developers meant that enough studios put in enough work to demonstrate the PS2's capabilities to their full extent. Over the years, PS2 owners got their hands on the likes of Shadow of the Colossus and others that showcased how, even up against the technically superior Xbox, Sony's console held its own. And that wraps it up. If you like what we're doing, please consider subscribing to our channel. We upload new videos daily, so make sure you don't miss them by subscribing. We appreciate your support, and we thank you for checking us out.